All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, look forward to very good discussion this afternoon uh, about uh, the new NACE anti-satellite test. Uh, as we all know, uh, back at the end of March, India successfully tested an anti-satellite weapon against one of its satellites, uh, becoming the fourth country to demonstrate the ability to deliberately destroy a satellite. With this intercept, India, um, uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi hailed it as a major step towards Indi uh, for Indian uh, security um, and proof that India had become a space power, in his words. Um, while reaction from most other governments has been relatively muted, uh, there has been concerns raised by civil society and the commercial space world um, about the test and about some of the impacts it has both in the space environment and to international norms of behavior for space more broadly. So the topic of this afternoon's discussion is to talk about the test and, and what it means uh, in the context of space security and stability and sustainability. Um, talk about you know, whether or not there actually has been a precedent established that this is a responsible thing to do. Um, how will it impact uh, both regional security as well as broader geopolitical issues? Uh, and, and, and is it uh, an impact on other space actors? With us here today to discuss this uh, is a panel of experts talking about different aspects of this. Um, on the end of the table there, we have Dr. Bob Hall. He's with Anacle Graphics Incorporated and serves as the director of the Commercial Space Operations Center, where he oversees day-to-day -day operations of the ComSpoc, including sensor management and on orbit threat processing. Uh, Bob has a background in systems engineering and project management of AGI's satellite toolkit software suite. Sitting next to me is Ankit Panda. He's the senior editor and a journalist at The Diplomat, and also an adjunct senior fellow in the Defense Posture Project at the Federation of American Scientists, where he focuses on international security, defense, geopolitics, and economics. Um, most recently, he has had some excellent coverage of South and East Asian missile and space security activities, covering activities in China and um, and, and India and, and other areas in the region. Uh, and finally, in between them is Ms. Victoria Sampson. She's the Washington Office Director here at Secure World Foundation. She's got 20 years of experience working on space and national security issues with a particular focus on missile defense, nuclear arms control, and space security. Uh, and most recently has been uh, traveling the world to different places, talking with people about the reactions to the Indian ASAT test and what it means. So hopefully get a little bit broader perspective on that. Um, the format for today, we've asked each of them to prepare a few minutes of opening remarks, uh, and then we're gonna open it up to a Q&A discussion after that. Also a reminder that today's event is on the record. Uh, it's being recorded and we posted it to our website after the event. So without any further ado, I think we'll start with Bob. Um, from your technical background and, and what you'll be seeing through the data collected by the ComSpoc, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about the dynamics of the test and maybe what impact it had on the space environment. All right. Thank you, Brian. I, I Hopefully uh, what I prepared here is going to address just that. Um, and I am going to try and stick to the technical facts about the space environment. And I think from a policy perspective, I think the rest of the table has that well covered. So I will, I will attempt to steer clear of policy comments. Um, and I think I've wrangled 10 or 15 minutes, but I'm going to still have to speak fast. I apologize for that. So uh, we know by now that uh, this test happened March 27th. India announced it that day. We were able to pretty quickly reconstruct it uh, via things like a notum, where they publish a notice to airmen. Uh, and then uh, very quickly, you can uh, drill down through what assets are on orbit, by, owned by India, and what flew that range at that time. Uh, fast forward to... Uh, later on, uh, the 18th Space Control Squadron, formerly the JSPOC, has said that there are hundreds of pieces that they are now tracking as a result of this. And as of Friday, there are 94 pieces that have been added to the public catalog. So that is a, a fraction of the debris that's been generated, but that just gives you a sense of the, the number of objects that the, the I was going to say the JSPOC, the 18th is, is tracking. So very quickly, that there's an example of the, the NOTAM. Uh, which is, you can find it on the web. In this case, T.S. Kelso, T. S. Kelso, who you probably know, uh, was very good at this, and he was on it right away and, and dug that up. And like I said, when you, when you see that, it, it, it narrows your focus very quickly. 
So um, this is a, a representative scenario where we see uh, Microsat flying north uh, and the ASAT was launched in a suddenly direction. Uh, this was done in the day or two after the event using, uh, we have uh, debris modeling and simulation tools, fragmentation modeling analyses that have been validated that we use. And based on the mass of the objects and the engagement, uh, we, our, our tools tell us that there were over 6,000 pieces greater than one centimeter were generated. And that's what you see here, all these, these red dots. I'm going to abbreviate this because we'll see this again in a minute or two. Um, a week or so later was the first time that the 18th released any data. The, they first published 58 pieces. And one of the things we always do is we cross-correlate. If, if you can see here, the, the plane of the red lines, they're not all exactly coplanar, but they come together in a pinch point at the time that they originated from. And you see that that pinch point uh, is here and sideways is here. So they corroborate the analysis that at this was the time, this was the place that all these debris pieces came from. And like I said, since then, they've, they've uh, published another 30 odd pieces. Since then, it's like India went and did a press tour. They put out a whole YouTube video saying, look at me, look what we did. Uh, and it was a treasure trove of information. Uh, you may have seen uh, that the diplomat published an article just the other day and they did great detective work going through the engineering data that was in that YouTube video, which either India didn't care about or didn't realize that the level of detail that was in that video. Um, but the best part was the kill shot at the very end, the very last second of what the seeker saw, the infrared seeker saw right before it destroyed the satellite. So, so this is a, a, a little bit of a view of the, um, a side view, if you will, of the pieces. These are the, the 6,400 or 6,466 pieces greater than one centimeter. It's a little hard to see the red dots with the lights here, but um, you may be able to see that some of them, they're not all down here in Leo, and, and some of them have come way up here. And the reason for that is that this is a hypervelocity collision. Uh, it's, it's not, the, the, I know that the, the article the other day that Dr. Longbrook published, he did a great uh, detective work to pull out the geometry thanks to the data they released. Uh, but it, it is in some sense a little bit insensitive to the geometry of the engagements because it's a hypervelocity collision that we get this uh, large dispersal, if you will. Uh, now, in terms of the, the debris being up there, uh, there are cycles that we go through, solar cycles, which will help drive the atmosphere and thus the drag, and thus how quickly those pieces will come back. And unfortunately, it turns out that we are here kind of in between cycle 24 and 25, meaning the drag is slightly less. So these pieces, uh, relatively speaking, will be up there longer than, let's say, had they been generated five-ish years ago. This is, I want to dwell on this for a second. These are the results of our uh, debris uh, based on intercept and explosions tool, our DEBI tool, which uses a NASA standard model for breakups uh, with some ESA enhancements. But this tool uh, computed over uh, 6,400 pieces greater than one centimeter. So that is a lot of new debris in the LEO environment when the day before, the minute before, we didn't have these 6,400 pieces. Uh, and how to read this is uh, each contour is one unit. And the reason I did that is because way out here in this range, we even see some pieces out here. Uh, so in the two to five centimeter range, there are pieces that will be up there three to four years. Now I've talked about what the JSPOC, or, sorry, the 18th is publishing. For, for argument's sake, what's being published in the public catalog is probably in the five to 10 centimeter range. The, that's the detectability threshold at least based on what they publish, based on the SSN, the Space Surveillance Network's tracking ability. So my reason for saying that is all, all this stuff down here is probably not able to be tracked without the new space fence, which is not yet online. So there's a ton of debris smaller than what's even been cataloged. The other thing is uh, this, this graph looks a little weird over here, and that's because I went to contour levels of individual uh, objects and the contours are just too dense over here. This really doesn't, whoops, this really doesn't matter though because um, this is, we, we are now in the six-ish week range. So we're kind of over here right now. And like I said, 
Most of the pieces come in with a few months, but some of them are up there for way more than a year. This is, again, is the fragmentation analysis, which is in past events, we've, we've validated this. So now I want to talk about these are the pieces that have been published by the 18th Space Control Squadron. So I say published. So reports are that they are tracking hundreds of pieces. As I said, as of Friday, they're up to 94. So all I can show you is what they published, meaning they probably have many, many more. Uh, this was backdated to the event. Uh, and so this is, if you look at the timestamp up here, this is basically the day of the event, and you see them spreading out in track in the orbit. Uh, if I could have stopped that at the beginning, you would have noticed that they were not all at a pinch point. That's due to the nature of TLEs. Uh, what I mean by that is if you back propagate them all to the time of the event, they don't all come together. The planes come together, but the, the in-track direction, they, they don't. It, it turns out that it, it's really, really hard to separate all these pieces and do the orbitology on them. And so we know that when you go back to the event, there's a little bit of spread. We don't get too wrapped up about that. I'm going to fast forward to uh, just Friday, five weeks after the event, and now it, things are a little bit different. Yes, I changed the color on you just to confuse you. Um, two things. The, the guys are spread out more around the entire orbit plane. Uh, two, we've lost some. So at this point, uh, depending on how you do your math, we're on the order of 28 or 30 of these pieces, of the published pieces, have decayed. At the same time, there's another 30 to 35 that the 18th has continued to add to the catalog. So round numbers, this is about the same as what I had in the previous video. And then for reference purposes, just to, to, to give you the sense of where we are, uh, the ISS orbit is in green coming through. And if you look at how high up these guys are going, and, and, and if you watch where the green orbit goes, the green orbit is below the highest of these. And this is exactly uh, what Jim Bridenstine was talking about several weeks ago, where he said, this event has increased the threat to the human lives on the space station because the debris has gone higher. So that is uh, both this and the previous analysis. You know, the Indians have said the debris was going to come down within 45 days. Uh, it was a head-on hit. And, and Dr. Langbrock's article the other day kind of shows why that's not true. But again, the data analysis says it's not all coming down in 45 days. In fact, this is what we've put together as of uh, this morning. These are the pieces that have been published. And so this is measured in weeks after the event. So we're sitting. I'm at a pretty bad angle here, but we're sitting here about six weeks. So we've had about 20 or 30 pieces come in, and there's this longish tail. Uh, the interesting thing is we have at least one piece way out here. That one piece is over three years. That, that's a piece that's big enough to be tracked by the 18th. So that's a piece that's probably at least five to 10 centimeters. Um, and, and actually, this morning, I was working feverishly on this because I was questioning that. And I had some of our, our orbit experts back home re-verifying that, no, yay verily, this piece, if you take the data that the 18th has published, is not going to come in for almost three years. The other thing we're seeing with some of these pieces is, as we continue to assess the lifetime day after day and week after week, some of their lifetime, their predicted lifetimes, are stretching or growing. Uh, part of it is there's some uncertainty in the TLEs that are being released. Um, but, but part of it is uh, just due to the nature of the, the objects themselves and perhaps how they're orienting in the drag and how big they are. So bottom line is India said they'd come in within 45 days, which is right around, well, I think this week we'll cross 45 days. And we have a lot of pieces still up there, tracked pieces. Remember the, the, the fragmentation analysis, there's 6,000 pieces total. So we'll have hundreds of pieces that'll be up there for a while. What does that mean? Uh, we have another tool, this uh, debris risk evolution and dispersal tool, where I can me measure the accumulated or integrated likelihood of fragments in the orbit where the object is. And so for several objects, we see that that, that likelihood, again, for pieces that came off this event exists, including um, number 58 on the list is the ISS. So these are not huge, huge numbers, but still, these are numbers above zero that say the risk has increased for these objects due to this event. So bottom line is both our fragmentation modeling and our analysis of the published 
data that have to emphasize that that means that they are above a certain size, so it's not the whole population, show that the claim that India made is not true, that it's, it's going to be up there. Um, it, it's gone higher than they said. It's, and they said, oh, we're going to hit it head on. It's all going down. That's not the case. And then it's going to be up there much longer than what they claimed. So the implications of that, I'll leave to you guys. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. That, that was great. Um, so with that technical background in mind, let's now turn to more of the, the political and, and geostrategic analysis. Uh, and so, Anne, could I like you to, to pick up things where we are here and talk a bit about what the Indian domestic politics were and sort of how they saw the motivations for the test and, and, and how they view it as part of their goals? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. And thanks, Bob, for that great setup on the uh, technical side of things. Um, so I'll talk about a few things, and the way I really see this Indian um, anti-satellite test is less as a demonstration of a counter space capability per se, and more as a real live validation of exoatmospheric hit to kill technologies. Um, and the nice thing about those technologies, depending on your perspective, of course, is that you can use them against orbital targets like India did, or against suborbital targets like ballistic missiles. Um, and there is obviously a history here. In 1999, one year after India and Pakistan both broke out as nuclear states, uh, nuclear possessor states, um, India's ballistic missile defense program began in earnest. And 20 years later, we see this anti-satellite demonstration. And while it's true that this was the first time India shot down an orbital target and shot down a satellite, what is also true is that this is the highest ever um, intercept apogee that India has demonstrated with its ballistic missile defense testing. In 2017, India used a Prithvi defense vehicle interceptor to conduct an intercept at 100 kilometer altitude. Uh, but this is, was considerably higher. Uh, I think it was at about 282 kilometers. Prime Minister Narendra Modi said it was 300 kilometers. That was obviously emphasized. And I'll just talk a few, um, just a little bit more specifically about the Prime Minister's remarks on the day. Um, I was watching them live. Um, it was about, I think it was 3 or 4 a.m. in New York City where I'm based. So um, I, I heard that the Indians were about to make a surprise announcement and nobody really had any idea what it was going to be regarding um, there was just a major India-Pakistan um, bout of escalation at the end of February, of course. So there was some consider a concern that it might have been pertaining to that issue, uh, but it wasn't, uh, right? Modi announced that India was now a space superpower and that it had destroyed one of its own satellites in low Earth orbit. Um, but he emphasized that this was a very prompt operation. The promptness was something that the prime minister really talked about. He said this whole thing was done in three minutes. Um, and that's a little bit of a strange thing to emphasize with a uh, counter space capability in some ways. But it's highly relevant when it comes to ballistic missile defense. And um, immediately after the prime minister's address, the Indian Ministry of External Affairs was ready with a FAQ document that was sent out to reporters and uh, publicized widely. And in that document, um, it answered the question of what exactly India had used as the kill vehicle. Um, and they clarified that it was a ballistic missile defense interceptor, capital B, capital M, capital D. Um, it wasn't called, you know, the anti-satellite interceptor or anything like that. Uh, they owned up to the fact that it was a BMD interceptor. The DRDO video um, that Bob talked about gave us a little bit more information about the code name of the weapon itself, which is apparently DRDO is calling this the Prithvi Defense Vehicle Mark II. So this is very much technologically um, the latest iteration of India's indigenous ballistic missile defense capability. And uh, it just so happens in April, um, reports in India uh, suggested that DRDO had now declared that phase one of India's indigenous ballistic missile defense efforts um, were now completed. And that, uh, those reports weren't necessarily related directly to the ASAT test, but I just find it interesting that just a few weeks after the anti-satellite demonstration, um, we see India declaring phase one of its BMD plans completed. Um, so why does this matter and what are some of the strategic stability and geopolitical consequences? Um, so since 1998, uh, since South Asia really entered the nuclear age, um, we've seen sort of a game of cat and mouse between India and Pakistan uh, in terms of coping with these new realities in the region. Um, basically, since the mid-2000s or so, around 2007, 2008, India has been put in a box by Pakistan, uh, given Pakistan's deployment of uh, low-yield battlefield nuclear weapons. Uh, in particular here, I'm talking about 
the Nasser system. Um, I'll just briefly talk about both countries' nuclear strategies, since I think it's important to understand that, to understand why this kind of a ballistic missile defense interceptor uh, demonstration might matter in the future. Um, so in 1999, India releases a draft nuclear doctrine emphasizing a policy of um, no first use, trying to cl clarify that India's nuclear weapons will only be used uh, to retaliate proportionally. That's changed in 2003 to um, clarify the fact that India would retaliate massively um, and inflict unacceptable damage on Pakistan. To cope with that, Pakistan uh, transitions to a, a the development of these low-yield tactical nuclear weapons that will be deployed early in a conflict uh, with the intention of effectively nullifying an Indian strategy that was developed in the early 2000s to use mechanized conventional um, brigades to incur um, to enter Pakistani territory. And that was done after a crisis between the two countries in 2002 after a Pakistan-based terrorist group attacked the Indian parliament. Um, so what happens by the late 2000s is that India doesn't really have a good response to that, right? Because um, it's simply not credible that if Pakistan were to one day use low-yield tactical nuclear weapons against Indian mechanized divisions on its own territory, <coughs> that India would retaliate massively against a Pakistani city. So the solution to that, um, we're still we're still waiting to you know see an actual change in India's doctrine. The doctrine remains the same, but there are signs that Indian strategy is is beginning to shift uh, to deal with this new reality. Um, some of that I think has been seen with the recent um, crisis between the two countries that India's old practice of strategic restraint is maybe less restrained today. Um, the crisis in February marked the first use of conventional air power by one nuclear armed state against the territory of another um, in history. Uh, in the Cargill War in 1999, when the two countries fought each other, uh, the Indian Air Force did not cross the line of control to strike Pakistan. Yet this time, we saw Pakistani territory stricken. But anyways, coming back to the issue of ballistic missile defense, um, why can BMD enable India to potentially move away from the kind of nuclear strategy that it's deployed since 1999? Uh, BMD would employ uh, allow India to think more seriously about uh, damage limitation uh, against Pakistan. So in a crisis, India may choose now to use conventional weapons to try and disarm Pakistan of its own nuclear weapons, effectively in the nuclear jargon, deploying a counterforce uh, style of nuclear strategy. And ballistic missile defense would allow India to effectively sweep up the residuals. Uh, if, if, let's say, a Shaheen-3 medium-range ballistic missile, uh, which would reach an apogee of around, let's say, 600 kilometers on, on its way to a city like Kolkata on the Indian East Coast, um, were to be launched by Pakistan, uh, these kinds of hit-to-kill, um, high-altitude exoatmospheric interceptors like the Prithvi Defense Vehicle Mark II um, I think demonstrate to Pakistan that India is now entering a place where these kinds of technologies are starting to become available. So I would fully expect in the future that we will see India conduct um, a similar test against probably a suborbital target. Um, there are certain reasons to choose an orbital target for a first demonstration. The, um, the ease of intercepting an orbital target given um, the kind of information that India had, obviously about Microsat R's trajectory specifically, um, may have made that a compelling candidate for a first kind of test. Um, the Indian official response, of course, I think merits a little bit of discussion because what I've said is not in India's um, official FAQ document. Uh, none of it is. It's it, it's 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 worded as a very anodyne document saying that this is about protecting our own space-based assets because India is a civilian spacefaring nation as well. Um, and that just doesn't really make all that much sense to me because the, the theory there would be to practice effectively deterrence by punishment, uh, that if another country were to shoot down an Indian satellite, that India would retaliate in kind using its counterspace capabilities. Um, yes, we could have a discussion about core, uh, you know, co-orbital counterspace capabilities, but uh, really I think this is more about Pakistan. Um, and of course there is the prestige angle that I think merits discussing. The fact that the Indians decided to call this test Mission Shakti, evoked the 1998 nuclear tests, which were called also um, Shakti. Um, so the fact that that was, again, redeployed, I think, um, mattered for the prime minister. Obviously, we're in election season right now in India. We'll find out the results of that at the end of this month. But um, the fact that this test did also occur before an election, I think, uh, merits a little bit of discussion. The um, the results of the February crisis, of course, I think uh, should be should not be seen in the context of this anti-satellite test. There was an initial Indian attempt in early February before the major terrorist attack in February that killed 40 Indian soldiers that precipitated the crisis between the two countries. So India was planning on doing this in the first place. But there is an you know there is an interesting counterfactual there that if the February 12th intercept had actually succeeded in India's anti-satellite test that occurred then, would the prime minister have made a national address? Uh, it's not so clear to me. Obviously, we don't have that counterfactual. 
Um, but he chose to do it, and it was um, it was really a moment of emphasizing, um, you know, nationalism and the fact that India had now entered this exclusive club of countries uh, that had these uh, kinds of capabilities. Um, with regard to China and the potential application of a weapon like this. Um, I said this a day after the ASAT test when asked by you know, reporters about how the China angle factors into this. And I, I really think that in any hypothetical India-China conflict, if India is at the point where it's seriously considering escalation by destroying Chinese satellites in low Earth orbit, uh, the crisis has probably already escalated to a place where India is going to be poorly positioned to manage that conflict. Um, so. I think this is less about China. It is about prestige. Um, but overall, I think the main strategic significance uh, boils down to the applications that hit to kill technologies like this do have for ballistic missile defense. So I'll end there. I'm happy to elaborate on that in the Q&A. Great. Thank you very much. And and also for reminding us that even though us space people tend to focus about space stuff, there is broader there are broader issues here at play that may impact things beyond just the space world. Um, so, Victoria, um, you just came back from a, a trip to India. We're talking about space policy. So if you could, you know, talk a little bit about what the international reaction has been, what the Indian space world is talking about this, and sort of what you think the impact might be then. Great. Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. As Brian said, I just came back. Um, I was in India last week, New Delhi, and the Secure World Foundation co-sponsors an annual conference every year, um, the Kapana Chaba Space Dialogue, um, which looks at various aspects of issues affecting space security and stability and sustainability. And of course, um, ASAT test was discussed, um, something. So I'll be talking a little bit about um, kind of the rumor mill that I heard, uh, things people said to me that I read that um, that I heard about there and talking a little about India's, their thinking on this issue and um, some of their capabilities. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things I just want to emphasize, and this always surprises me when I think about it, you know, India has been a space power since the early 60s. Um, they've been very thoughtful and, and strategic in how they use space. India does not actually have a national space policy. So think about that for a minute. No white papers, nothing really just directing how they're going to go on this. They have um, the 1991 satellite communications policy. They have a 2011 remote sensing policy, and that's it. Um, if you talk to Indian policymakers, they say, well, this is kind of a feature, not a bug. This gives us some flexibility. But there has been discussion about maybe now that they're expanding their use of space, they need to have some sort of national space policy. Um, or maybe they only need to have a civil space policy and let DRDO take care of the military space. Um, but there, I think this kind of was a tipping point for them in terms of, okay, things are changing. We need to really think about how we're going to go ahead with this. Um, interestingly enough, while they don't have a national space policy, I read an article that said they're looking at a security space strategy because now they have toys to play with um, and they probably should figure out how they want to handle it. We'll see what ends up happening with that. Um, Anka talked a little bit about Prime Minister Modi's statement, but I want to emphasize that while um, <clears throat> he said repeatedly our capability is not against anyone, it's defensive entirely. Um, I heard repeatedly, okay, it's defensive, India has the right peaceful use of space, you know, protecting our space assets, but we have to protect ourselves against China and Pakistan constantly. So it's not against anyone, but it's, it's protecting against China and Pakistan. Um, as well, um, he, and Prime Minister Modi said, India is, has always been against an arms race in outer space. That policy has not changed. Um, how they, I guess it comes down to different definitions of how you look at arms race in outer space, and that's a broader discussion about how the U.S. looks at space security and stability, and maybe some of the other countries look at it. Other countries look at it as, you know, a space weapon is only something that literally goes up in space, whereas I think a lot of people in the United States have a, a broader discussion of anything that disrupts the stability of the space domain can be threatening. Um, the Ministry of External Affairs, as has been mentioned, put out a statement almost immediately. Um, and they said, again, the test was done to verify that India has the capability to safeguard its space assets. Um, but they, you know, so again, defensive. Um, space is a common heritage of humankind, and that you see a lot from Mia's statements. Um, they emphasize that um, India is a party to all the major space treaties, participated in the Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space. Um, India has um, supported the idea of no first placement of weapons in space. Um, this is important because this is uh, largely affiliated with the Russians. It's something they've been pushing in international fora um, pretty widely. And also interesting because it's something the United States does not typically support. Um, we don't support no first use for nuclear weapons, and we typically do not support no first placement in space because that implies there's going to be a second placement. Um, 
As well, the Indians have come out supporting the idea of the PPWT, which is a very long acronym for a proposed treaty by the Russians and Chinese, looking at the prevention and placement of weapons in space, primarily space-based missile defense. Um, again, this has been a bone of contention in international discussions because it comes down to what do you see as the biggest threat for space security and stability? For Russia, China, and their allies, the, in, this includes India, I guess, in this context, um, there's been a focus on an actual weapon placed on orbit. Um, whereas an anti-satellite test like India had, like China had, like the United States test in 2008, would be A-OK -okay according to the PPWT. Whereas the US and its allies tend to look at it more as idea of congestion, you know, competition, that sort of thing. That The, the change in the space domain, that's really where a lot of the threats are. Um, and um, yeah, so th they pushed that as well. Um, there was a speaker from the MIA at the dialogue last week, and he talked about how international um, legal system is insufficient for currently how space is being used. He said, in multi-level four, there's not been as much progress as been expected due to difference in opinions on key issues, i.e. no agreed upon definition for space weapons, satellites and other objects can have dual use, you may not be able to comply with the future regime, and then he pointed out only a few nations have SSA to verify compliance. Um, but again, emphasize India has opposed the weaponization of space um, and then uh, pointed out that um, India wants to be a constructive role in debate for, as a responsible space-faring nation and would like to participate in future negotiations to strengthen the national legal regime applicable to arms race in outer space. Um, and then they point out that India would actually support legally binding transparency and confidence building measures. Um, again, the multilateral four, there's kind of a push-pull between how we're going to ensure space is secure and stable in the long term. Do we have a treaty? Do we have non-legally binding and yet powerful transparency and competent billing measures? Um, he, the, the Secretary Pandey said that India supports legally binding transparency and competent billing measures as long as there's universal application, they're non-discriminatory, and they're agreed upon by states. So... Well, I thought Ankit's uh, theory was very interesting. Uh, I'm going to focus on the space aspects, um, but I think the BMD stuff is definitely, I think, relevant um, as well. Um, this is, well, this change, having an ASAT test, um, was the first time for India. Uh, according to the head of DRDO, um, Sachin Shreddy, this is not a one-time event. Um, he has said they are working on a lot of different technologies, and he kind of gave a rogues gallery sort of discussion, working on directed energy, doing EMP, doing co-orbital. I mean, again, and I recognize a lot of this may be just playing to the crowd or discussing things for domestic audiences. Uh, certainly every country does that when they're talking about the capabilities. But as, if you look at our counter space threat assessment, we do discuss some directed energy work that they've been doing, and so it doesn't surprise me that they are thinking about it. Co-orbital doesn't surprise me as well, just because that's, I think, um, I think the next steps in terms of close approach for space capabilities. Um, I am um, Secure World, just a side note, we um, work on a project for DARPA it's called Confer's Consortium for execution of rendezvous and proximity operations. Did I get the acronym right? Thank you. Um, basically, the idea that commercial actors will come together and talk about best practices for close approach rendezvous and proximity operations. Um, talking to Indians last week, they are very interested in what's going on with that, and they would like to learn a lot more about it. So I think there is absolutely an interest in close approach work there. Again, that's always dual use. It doesn't mean necessarily it's going to be weaponized. It can be done for completely legitimate, non-weaponized things, but I think the interest is definitely there. Um, <clears throat> as well, um, such as Freddie said, that it is, if, quote, feasible to target multiple satellites with multiple launches of the interceptor. They can go up to 1,000 kilometers. Um, and they're reportedly interested in reaching both LEO and GEO with ASAT. Of course, this interceptor I don't think would be able to get to GEO. So I'm not sure what that means, if there's something else they're working on, or if it's just, again, conjecture, you know, it'd be nice to have sort of thing. Um, you know, we could have a whole discussion about why they need to get to GEO, whether you're targeting there, um, that sort of discussion I haven't heard much about. And then finally, uh, with Reddy, um, um, he said, uh, space is again important in the military domain. The best way to ensure security is to have deterrence. Um, he said there's no further plans on testing this particular ASAT, so we'll see what happens. They'll probably take a lesson from the U.S. and China's book and just have a missile defense test and use the same interceptor and call it a win. Um, because they point out their accuracy was pretty high on that. Um, 
going into a little bit some of the rumor mill um as we heard, um, you know, Indians have said, you know, we were trying to be very responsible. We designed the test very carefully, um, and I'm sure they did. Um, but you know, that's one of my criticisms of having this sort of capability proliferated is that things don't always work out exactly as you intend it. And so, oftentimes, you can have a great test, but things happen, and perhaps your angle of approach is closer, higher, you know, pointing up higher than you think, as we saw from Bob's presentation, and it goes from there. Um, there was a lot of um, People insisting that General Hayden had justified India's concern about their, you know, worried about their space assets when he testified in Center Armed Services. If you go back and actually read the testimony, he said they feel they need to have this capability. He did not say, I think India is being threatened and they need to have this capability. But if you talk to a lot of Indian policymakers, that's the implication that they got from that. Um, there were concerns um, about Pakistan, and again, given everything that Anka talked about, obviously things are bad. Um, side note, my flight was delayed uh, for quite some time because we were not allowed to fly over Pakistani airspace. I was on Air Canada flight. Um, there was concern that Pakistan would somehow get some sort of assistance from China, and it would be able to demonstrate its own ASAC capability. Um, and they saw you know, that as a distinct possibility. Um, this is probably, I say, this is the fifth year of this particular, the Kapanachawa dialogue. Secure World has been involved with it for the past four years. Um, I would say the rhetoric in Pakistan is probably the most aggressive that I've heard in the four years I've been going to this. Um, and then also interestingly, um, one of the presenters did kind of a relationship map of China with its um, countries in the neighborhood. And they had India listed as a foe of China. Um, so just again, think some of the thinking there. Um, so, you know, some some um, policy policymakers have said, well, you know, yeah, debris was created, but the ISS can handle it. You know, they're fine. Um, they uh, they have a debris monitoring thing. They've got hardened you know shield. They're okay. They can deal with it, um, which is probably not what the space station would like to have to handle with. I think that probably goes back to Mr. Breitenstein's criticism of it um, as well. Um, I had one person say to me, you know. So 300 pieces were recreated in the grand scheme of things, you know, hundreds of thousands that are there, what's the big deal? And you explain, okay, actually, it's not just a matter of debris was created, it's at the particular alt altitude and what it means in terms of orbital use and precedent scenting. And yeah, it's, it's probably not the best thing. Um, and these, you know, the, the emphasis that India's got a lot going on in space, they've got the second mission to the moon, they've got their Mars um, program, they've got the humans first, uh, first human, um, uh, astronaut coming up next three years or so, so they must make sure that space is stable and the ASAT helps them determine it is stable. Um, one of the things also, uh, Anka mentioned national pride. Um, you know, I heard a lot, I mean, we've seen that, you know, I think anyone who wrote, for a Westerner who wrote about this issue got this comment at some point, you know, if, why is it okay for the United States, Russia and China to have ASAT capabilities but not for India? Um, there's a sense like if they're a major space power, they should have that capability as well. Um, one thing that I thought was pretty interesting is that they were very interested in the difference in response from the West from the 1998 nuclear test to this ASAT test. You remember the 1998 nuclear test immediately criticized, put under sanctions. You know, a lot of very harsh rhetoric came out from this. Whereas for this particular ASAT test, you know, State Department said, we see that it happened and India as a strategic partner, you know, which I understand is how they like to rephrase it. Um, the only, as I was mentioned, the only U.S. government person that came out critical of this was Administrator Bridenstine, who almost the next day later had to dial back what he said um, under pressure from the White House. So they were, I think they've taken that lesson to heart. That now they're a strategic partner, they have more flexibility in terms of what they can do. Um, and then finally, um, there is a common concern by the Indians, and I've heard this before, that they're being held um, accountable for treaties that they did not sign. They pointed out the missile technology control regime. The United States put Israel under um, sanctions for colluding with the Russians back in the early 90s, and said we didn't actually sign the missile technology control regime. The, India has since joined it, but that's from the past couple years. And of course, India has always been upset that it's being held as a non-nuclear non weapon state according to the, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So that's a point of frustration for them. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna wrap up, because I think I've gone over my time a little bit, but talking a little bit about um, 
some of the space situational awareness capabilities. Um, right now, India has um, 18 commercial satellites of its own, 20 Earth observation, eight navigation, two space science. Overall, India has launched over 400 satellites. Of those, 297 were for foreign countries, for 31 different countries. So India, obviously, is a very active space program. Um, but they are largely dependent on TLEs from the United States. So they're actively working to improve their space mission awareness so they have that kind of capability, which is good because if they're going to be having ASAT tests and throwing things up in orbit, you really hope they have the ability to track it and not just do it and d design the test and then walk away from it at that point. Um, they've commissioned um, their uh, uh, to, to track, to tracking radar. Um, they've got um, an agreement. Supposedly, there have been discussions with the United States on the space mission awareness agreement. That has not come to fruition yet, but they're working on it. Um, they do space object, object proximity analysis. They do a close approach um, analysis. They have their multi-object tracking radar, which can track objects at a 50 centimeter dimension at 800 kilometers range. It has successfully tracked the PSLV upper stages and the Electron RB as debris targets. It's uh, presently undergoing refurbishment and internal assessments. And they have a new um, thing called NETRA. Network for Space Object Tracking and Analysis, which is dedicated facilities for SSA. It would have um, observation facilities, um, three optical telescopes, a couple radars, and then augment existing facilities with a control center for analysis in, Bang in Bangalore. The objectives would be to establish observation capabilities of space objects through a network of indigenous tracking, to evolve uh, a mechanism to process tracking observations, make an assessment of SSA, and disseminate SSA information in a timely manner. And then finally, to participate in global efforts in information exchange on resident space objects. And they have a proposed uh, phased array radar with multi-object tracking capabilities and the idea that it would track space objects with uh, more than seven, seven centimeters in diameter up to 30 to 100 kilometers range. So even if they go for geo, they can't track it, but um, they're trying to do LEO at least. So with that, I think I will stop and lead to questions. Thank you. Um, so we're going to open up for questions now. Um, I've got several that I prepared, uh, but I want to ask, start by asking, uh, Irene, did you want to ask a question before you have to head out? Okay, great. Um, so uh, as usual, uh, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand, identify yourself, uh, and make sure you state your question in the form of a question. Um, so we want to start up here towards the front. Hi, everyone. Uh, Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Ridhu Pavandas, Counselor Political with the Indian Embassy. Uh, I was obviously listening intently to the views expressed by the panelists. You know, this is a free independent country and respect all your views. India is also a free independent democratic country, very proud country indeed. Well, uh, you know, uh, all of you uh, referred to FAQs which came out in the MEA. You referred to our Prime Minister's remarks. Uh, before I get down to uh, those specific things, well, you know, uh, uh, I would first get into uh, you know this this tendency of uh, uh, people to get into China and Pakistan immediately. Uh, well, uh, you know, you're aware of uh, you know some of the things which happened. Uh, you know, uh, the, you know, uh, you know specifically in February on Saint Valentine's Day, which was you know essentially. Uh, uh, a day of love converted into a day of terror by you know who. Uh, so you know, let's not really try to conflate issues here. Uh, let's let's stick to uh, what we have on the table, uh, because you know, uh, India doesn't need to be apologetic about whatever it has done. You know, we have a minimum credible deterrence in place. Our first no first use doctrine is well known, and I would not really like this to get into a nuclear kind of debate between you know uh, you know that India needs to do this and that. Uh, because, you know, if you ask me honestly, uh, during the period of February, March, specifically when we are ex absolutely restrained, uh, you know, uh, in, 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 in conducting ourselves, and there were statements coming out of a particular government, I'm not going to name it, you know it, uh, saying, trying to uh, dissuade world attention uh, from the core issue of terrorism uh, by, by drawing the world into something uh, which is, you know, which is what they normally do, into some kind of a nuclear... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, scenario uh, where, you know, you say that, you know, well, you know, two nuclear armed powers close to each other. Now what's going to happen? They, they are, they're going to like, this is going to escalate into a nuclear kind of thing. 
So, you know, so they keep on doing it. We did not do it. We are very restrained, though we believed that our threshold uh, was being tested uh, and, you know, you know about, know about Bala Court and all that. So let's not get into that. Let's not conflate issues. Let's stick immediately to ASAT. Uh, though the panelists, uh, and I would respectfully defer to all of them, did mention to the FAQs, I think it's my bounden duty to tell you, uh, you know, some of these things, uh, which, which are very important. One, uh, I, I saw, uh, I saw uh, some, some uh, you know, data being, uh, you know, shown. I respect, uh, as I said, studies. Uh, you know, on the debris and all that, uh, you know, uh, but I'd like to address uh, those concerns. Uh, you know, India was conscious of such concerns to begin with, uh, and the dangers posed by space debris, right? So it conducted a test in a manner uh, to minimize the incidence and longevity of such space debris. Uh, you know, uh, it's not merely uh, for effect, our Prime Minister has said so, and I'm going to repeat here, that, you know, after having conducted extensive simulations, the ASAT test being referred to on 27th of March was intentionally conducted in low Earth orbit at an altitude of 280 kilometer to ensure that there would be minimal space debris and that it would not pose any danger to objects in outer space. So as per the st simulation studies, whatever debris would have been generated, we're not saying no to it, right? Whatever debris would have been generated was expected to have decayed and fallen back to Earth within a brief time frame. And further, you know, I have again heard references to ISS uh, and all. I, I don't think there's been any specific concern in relation to the ISS, which is at, at an altitude much higher than that at which the test was conducted. Uh, if I may add here, there was an initial statement from NASA expressing concern and then uh, and then there was another statement from NSC uh, saying that those concerns were not really, uh, 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 you know, uh, there was no need for such concerns. So there have been views expressed by the U.S. Department, I mean, uh, the U.S. government on this, uh, uh, on, on, on this particular ASAT test. If I may take one more minute of your time, I know I'm taking a lot of time. I'm conscious of that. Um, you know, uh, you know. Let's not be apologetic when I say that India. Uh, this test was a demonstration of our technological capabilities to defend and secure our wide-ranging interests in outer space. But, if I may add, the test was purely defensive in character and not targeted at, against any country. Uh, and, uh, you know, as a major uh, space-faring nation, we have made significant strides. Uh, you know, panelist Samson referred to uh, the fact that we have been uh, in this uh, since the 1960s very proudly, uh, you know, doing a lot of things. You mentioned uh, the moon mission, uh, uh, sorry, the Mars mission. Uh, and other things, the human uh, human uh, capability, uh, uh, the human mission we're going to undertake in some time to come. We are very proud of what we, we have been doing, and you know we are we we remain opposed to the weaponization of outer space. India has not, will not, resort to an arms race in outer space. Other countries might do so. We are not really into it, uh, and we have been a consistent advocate of the importance of preserving outer space as a common heritage of mankind we remain committed to maintaining outer space as an ever expanding frontier of cooperative endeavor rather than conflict uh, 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 panelist samson referred to some of the initiatives uh, that we have undertaken in this uh, regard the, in, in multilateral fora i uh, though at the risk of repetition would like to uh, uh, state them all because uh, i think these are important things uh, you know, as I said, uh, India supports a substantive consideration of the prevention of an arms race and outer space within the multilateral framework of the UN. We remain committed to the negotiation of a legally binding instrument on the prevention of an arms race and outer space to be negotiated in the conference and disarmament, where it has been on the agenda since 1982. India has been an active participant in the group of governmental experts on the prevention of an arms race and outer speech, uh, space, which conducted a session recently. At the 73rd session of the first committee last year, India voted in favor of all resolutions submitted under the outer space cluster, including on the prevention of an arms race in outer space, which were also co-sponsored. Uh, further, if I could just... Just, the, uh, just, just, 10 seconds, quickly. just 10 seconds. Hey, you guys, I had actually and reached out to them let them know this happening, and he had the right So to further the practical statement. measures for the prevention of an arms race in outer space on no first placement of weapons in outer space, as well as on transparency and confidence, confidentiality, confidence-building measures in outer space activities. What I'm saying is I'm laying out our official position. We're very clear about what we did. 
uh, you know, as I said, purely defensive in character, not directed at any particular country. We have, we have our achievements to show off. Uh, we have the confidence of the world, references of me to some of the 1990s tests and all that. You'd, uh, because I, I would not like to conflate issues, but since were, those were mentioned, I would also say that when the India-US civilian nuclear deal was signed, we have the confidence of the world in terms of getting an NSC waiver also. So as far as trust of the world is concerned, we have that with us. So all I can say is, you know, uh, uh, you know, I think we have the confidence of the world, uh, and and we are willing to uh, address all these concerns. As I said, the debris thing, we have made it very clear: low Earth orbit, less than 280 uh, kilometers, lower, much lower than ISS, and all that. So some of these concerns perhaps are uh, were are out of place. Can I ask you to please wrap up, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. So, do you have another question? Are we in? Yes. I do have a I do have a question. Um, why do you think that the United States and the, the international community response to the ASAT test was so muted or non-existent? I can take first crack. Um, <clears throat> very good question. Um, I mean, I think part of it is there's concern that if we criticize other countries having ASAT tests, should the United States want to have one, we'll open ourselves up to that sort of criticism return. Um, I think there is definite uh, relation to our need for strategic partnership with India to counterbalance China. And so probably a concern we don't want to lose that part of the, tri the triangle to, you know, to counterbalance them. Um, most countries, I think the only countries that came out with official statements criticizing the Indians were Pakistan, China, in Germany, oddly enough. Although Germany did it in a roundabout way, it was at the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and Legal Subcommittee. And basically they talked about the need to not do sort of ASAT tests. And they, I think they literally hashtagged India in their statement, but they didn't criticize officially India in it. Um, so, you know, that, that was the way they did it. But so I think it has to do a lot more of the complication of the political environment right now. Um, yeah, so just to emphasize the, the sort of the, my perception on the U.S. point, um, yes, the original statement from Minister Bridenstine uh, was very negative about it, um, and I think justifiably so, given his position as the head of NASA uh, and with, with people, his own people on the ISS, uh, which is a very important international asset. Um, and then you saw, as he walked back that statement, after consulting the White House, um, I, I think it's pretty clear that at a higher level of the administration, uh, they are trying to forge this strategic partnership with India. Um, and I think a big part of that is to, as you said, to, to counterbalance China. And so then it looks like they made the decision not to uh, upset that potential relationship over this one incident. Um, I can say talking to the more rank and file people um, in the Department of Defense in the State Department, uh, th I get the sense they feel there should have been a stronger statement because they don't like the potential precedent it sets that it's okay to do this as long as you take some steps to make sure it was what you might say re call responsible um, because further countries might take that as a model and not all of them may be as technically capable or willing to, to, to limit the debris creation. Um, but I, I, I think it's it's pretty clear that in this particular case, uh, a decision was probably made that the broader partnership with India took priority over whatever impact this has on the space community. Additional questions? Uh, yeah, in the back, Thomas. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for hosting this uh, panel discussion. We really appreciate it. I have a question from a comment that Victoria made that I'm hoping the, the whole panel can respond to. You mentioned that Indian uh, defense officials had mentioned that this would not be a one-off test and other developments across the counter space spectrum could lead to further demonstrations. So I wanted to ask about uh, if we could hypothesize together if there were to be a non-kinetic successful anti-satellite test, um, what would be the role in the political environment? And um, if, if there is a role for the technical community in bouncing off the public data from the Air Force, but also independent private data. What, what is the, the use of that in a, a situation where no debris is created at all? Um, so Victoria, Anke, you guys want to comment on what a future follow-on test might look like and if there's a BMD versus ASAT? Yeah, I'll talk a bit about the BMD angle. Um, 
I mean, look, the BMD program isn't going anywhere. They've just said that they've completed phase one. Um, and with phase two, I'd expect to see um, intercepts occurring at similar altitudes. But of course, with suborbital targets, that's, uh, you know, debris is less of a concern. And obviously, it's much more difficult for the United States to criticize India when, you know, we regularly do missile defense tests here. Um, so that kind of testing is, I think, going to happen. I think what will be interesting is um, if and when we do get data on the kinds of interceptors that are used, and, and specifically the kill vehicle, uh, we have very good pictures and data from this last ASAT test. So I'll actually be curious to see how much of the technology that was used for the ASAT test actually survives uh, this testing cycle and makes it into the future of India's kind of BMD efforts indigenously. So just quickly on, on that, Ankit, um, so you talk quite a bit about, you know, you, you, your hypothesis has more to do with missile defense than it does and a satellite testing, and, and that sort of top of the technology is very related. Um, I want to unpack that a little bit and, and ask the question, why, if it is more about missile defense than anti-satellites, why did they chose to test it in an anti-satellite mode, given they probably could have gone again after a suborbital target and not generated the debris? Yeah, I mean, again, I can only hypothesize about why they chose not to do a ballistic missile defense test. So uh, the DRDO um, video, I believe, talks about multiple modes for the interceptor, which raises the question of what are those other modes, um, given that we know that it's a Perth V defense vehicle Mark II, which is a ballistic missile defense interceptor. I think it's pretty reasonable to surmise that the other mode is kinetic intercept of a ballistic missile defense um, of a uh, missile reentry vehicle. Um, the reason I think they chose to do this, right, so India has apparently had this capability um, for a few years now. Uh, there was an interview with the former uh, chairman of DRDO, uh, Dr. Saraswat, and he talked about how the previous government had basically um, didn't have the political will to move forward with an anti-satellite test at the time. Um, the factors could have been multiple. Uh, India's, you know, um, the general nature of India's application to things like the nuclear suppliers group, I think, hinged on India demonstrating a certain level of responsibility internationally. So maybe conducting an anti-satellite test back then would have made less sense. But now the political environment has changed. The geopolitical environment has changed with the United States, especially. So perhaps they chose to push away with that. There, of course, might be simply technological imperative to do this. Um, that certain people inside DRDO probably have always wanted to demonstrate an anti-satellite capability. It's also sort of one of those boxes you tick in the in, you know in joining the superpower club that you do ballistic missile defense, you do anti-satellite. Like Victoria said, you do uh, directed energy and a variety of other things, co-orbital. Um, so will the Indians move ahead and do other things? Um, I'm, I'm you know we've heard it from DRDO that they are working on several other kinds of technologies. So maybe this was about ticking that anti-satellite box, but. Of course, I think the core technology will be much more useful in a ballistic missile defense context. Hey, Victoria, any yeah. yeah, um, just a couple things. One, um, they may be working on EMP, but essentially it's a nuclear weapon they're going off in orbit. So I sincerely hope they do not try to test that um, capability. We'll just assume that they have it. Um, in terms of the role of data, I think it's really interesting because it's really difficult to ascertain intent, right? Um, you don't really know what's going what other countries' plans are, particularly if countries do not have national space policies or strategies. You can try and read to. You just have to look at the testing and guess from there. So I think the role for the like commercial SSA sector is to help increase transparency and awareness of what's happening in orbit space activities. And that way, you won't necessarily get intent, but you'll be able to have better clarification as to what's going on and go from there. And Bob, following up on that, um, I was going to ask you the question. You talked quite a bit about analyzing data produced by the U.S. military, these TLEs. Where do you see the role for this sort of independent commercial analysis? And where do you see the role of uh, where's commercial data to kind of validate these sorts of events? How is that shaping up and where is that going? Well, I, I would say there's, there's a few aspects to that. Uh, when people talk commercial SSA, a lot of times the conversation is a conflated conversation between data and processing. And so uh, there is a large or growing uh, community of uh, data providers. Uh, and then the other side of the equation is, is you need uh, processing. And the commercial SSA processing is, is what allows you to really distill or pull out uh, finer detail of what's going on in orbit. So for example, when you look at the TLEs, the U.S. Air Force is uh, presently using technology that's a few decades old from an orbit determination standpoint for a, a long and sorted history. Um, but that, that only gets you so far when you start to watch what modern satellites can do, particularly when you're talking about rendezvous and prox ops uh, and you're trying to watch these close-in behaviors. 
Um, the other thing that, that um, commercial SSA can do is provide uh, a layer of transparency or attribution that the US DOD cannot provide. So it, when a commercial entity, uh, such as the Comspark or others, can, can lay on the table, we just saw this, we just saw that, the, the US, uh, the State Department, for example, doesn't have to divulge the capabilities of US sensors, US processes, to say what it saw. Uh, the, the, the analogy is, is with the commercial overhead imagery providers. When we see uh, North Korea preparing for a launch, for example, we don't use US national assets and lay a photograph on the table and say, hey, North Korea, what are you doing? We can lay an image from commercial overhead assets and say, hey, what are you doing? Commercial SSA has the same analog here, that we can help with that attribution. <coughs> and speaking of that attribution, we've seen uh, China be very aggressive in this, in this area. And by aggressive, I mean very aggressive test cycles, where they take satellites that are technology demonstrators, clearly could be dual use, but they do all kinds of testing where they do uh, extreme rendezvous and proxops tests, which again, they could claim it's for scientific purposes, it's for refueling, it's for servicing, it's whatever, but it could just as easily have military purposes. So I can't tell you that intent, but I can tell you what they're doing. And, and so to go back to the original question, if, if India were to continue with further demonstrations like co-orbital, they would be seen, the full intent would not be able to be determined. It could be a co-use type thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, work. so um, I want to pull back a little bit and look at the bigger international picture. I mean, China a few years ago did an experiment did a satellite test, which was actually much nastier than India's. It's at a higher altitude. It put out thousands of pieces of debris that will be descending through LEO for the next century. So if we keep doing this, somebody's going to screw it up royally, right? If, if, if country P and country I and country K and so on all feel like, well, they, I got to do an anti-satellite test too, something bad's going to happen. And so how can we sort of internationally stop that, or can we internationally stop that? Victoria, you want to take a first crack? <laughs> <laughs> I've got the answer. Um, no. Um, I mean, no, that, that, that is a concern. You know, I mean, it's the whole idea behind uh, you don't want nuclear weapons to proliferate because at some point someone's going to find it a good way to use them. Um, same thing with ASAC um, testing. At some point someone's going to screw up or they're going to find it, they're going to want to use it. There have been, the problem you run into is that a lot of the international discussions get really bogged down in the whole, should it be a treaty or should it be a non-legally binding measure? Um, and then they get bogged down on what the biggest threat is. And so it's really difficult to move ahead because basically they've been cycling through the same arguments, I would say, for the past two decades at least. Um, same thing over and over and over again. Um, we co-host a conference in Geneva every year at the Conference of Disarmament, which is part of the UN that discusses security, space security measures. And every year there's someone talking about no first placement and PPWT and the idea, you know, the, the basically the same answers that have not yielded any kind of solutions. Um, but there, are, in my mind, there is a ray of hope, but there have been some discussions about how we can do TCBMs in other ways and the idea of having um, guidelines maybe for ASAT tests, which is not ideal, but at least it's recognizing that it may be happening and so we want people to do it in a responsible manner. That has been brooded about as a possible way in which we could maybe move the conversation ahead a little bit. Um, the idea that you have tests at a low altitude, that you let people know that's happening, and um, you'd be pretty transparent about it. Um, that may be one way to avoid having these concerns in the future. It's a baby step, but um, there actually has been indication that it actually may get some major power support at some point. Um, obviously, this would not happen now. It would probably be you know, something we discuss in maybe five or ten years from now. You may see something come. You know, that's the nature, unfortunately, the international system, and that it just doesn't move that closely, that, that quickly. But that's also how you build consensus, and I think it's very important to build consensus because otherwise, countries don't feel like they have buy-in. If they don't have buy-in, they're not going to follow the agreements. Um, I would also argue that oftentimes countries, they don't have to do it just with the UN. They can. Make a you know unilateral decision. Okay, we're not gonna we're gonna have, these are our guidelines. We're gonna just if we want to have a set test, here's the rules that we're gonna follow. Other countries can take on from there. And I would um, encourage space powers to start thinking about the way they can demonstrate responsible use of um, space and being a responsible space actor. And maybe just unilaterally making these um, 
announcements and we can maybe build upon that from there. I mean, I'll just add a specific note on that. Um, so the country that I have most concern about is probably Russia. They've been developing the Noodle and that's probably a candidate for testing. They haven't done a kinetic hit to kill anti-satellite test. And now that the Indians have done it, the Russians see themselves as a superpower and they've been more comfortable with uh, toying the edge of international norms, let's say, over the past few years. Um, so I'm hoping that we can get to that before the Russians decide to conduct a test. Um, but that's probably the country that I have the most concern about right now. Uh, yeah, so along those lines, back in 2007, China did the test. And obviously, you can't know what they were thinking. But it, it seemed contemporaneously as if they were uh, surprised by the world reaction. And maybe you take that and indirectly you say, well, maybe they didn't uh, have an, a greater understanding of what, what the results of their test would be. Again, that's, that's a lot of assumptions in there. But subsequent to that, and I think, Brian, you guys have reported this, there were events uh, follow on of, of that program where the US has stated that they continued to conduct tests of that weapon system, but they were not engagement tests. They were purposely near misses perhaps because they learned their lesson and, and didn't want the ire of the world on them for the, for the Leo population. So from, again, from a debris standpoint, you know, this is maybe a progression where, where India said, hey, we're we, we not going to do what China did. That was pretty high. We're going to stay way low, and we're going to try and design it so the stuff comes in. So just apples to apples, way better test design. The, the, the intent was there. I would say, again, the debris analysis shows it, it's not always so simple, and we do have debris. Unlike the China test, it's not going to be up there for uh, a century, perhaps, but still. So, so the hope would be that, again, I was trying to not get into policy, but if there was a stronger world reaction to this, to say, okay, this was better, but still not good enough, that might drive us all to not having further tests. I, I don't know. Uh, just building yeah. on... Good. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, China was surprised by criticism in 2007 because it was not the first time they had tried to do it. They had done it several times prior and didn't get any kind of response. So I mm -hmm. think they were legitimately shocked by how uh, vehement it was protested. And along those lines, I mean, yeah. you guys talked about um, this was the, actually the second time India tried to do it. They tried the yeah. first time in February. So I just, uh, just to clarify that, uh, so yeah, two things there. One, I think there's, there's the debris environmental impact question, and then there's the proliferation of the technology question. I think you can address some of the environmental impact question by talking about ways to responsibly test an ASAT, lower altitude, you know, doing ways to, to minimize the creation of the debris. But then you're effectively saying it's okay to develop the technology and you're okay with that technology proliferating, which then raises concerns. Is somebody then going to go ahead and use it in a future conflict? And in the use of it, it's not going to happen at 300 kilometers because there's no military targets that low. It's going to happen higher and it's going to have much more dangerous uh, consequences. Um, as far as the prospects for an agreement, you know, as Victoria laid out, unfortunately, the, right now the major powers are talking past themselves, right, or past each other. Uh, Russia and China are pushing for uh, a treaty to prevent placing of weapons on orbit uh, based as a way to hinder the U.S space-based missile defense, but at the same time allowing them to develop their ground-based and satellite weapons that it, as a deterrent against the U.S. The U.S. for the last several years, maybe longer, has been saying no to any sort of agreement. They just want voluntary measures, voluntary guidelines. That's what, that's what they'll talk about. Um, you, There are a few people, uh, notably uh, Doug Levero, former OSD uh, Director of Space Policy, who has come out and said the U.S should be pushing for a, a, a narrow agreement that talks about banning this kind of kinetic testing of NSA satellite weapons. Uh, in general, you would think that the, the U.S. government would be behind that because they're the most to lose, but there is still a strong contingent in the U.S. government that does not want to limit freedom of action. They want to keep their options as open and as, as wide open as possible. Unfortunately, even if that means everyone else gets to do the same thing. Uh, I have not seen that dynamic shifting yet in the U.S. government to the where the DOD and the IC will be supportive of limiting as sort of supporting a ban, but one can hope that at some point they might. But until that happens, 
the U.S. is not going to probably be a leader on this. So the question is, is there another country out there that's going to be willing to propose something other than the PPWT uh, that deals with a narrow issue like this and then try to try to rally support for it? I haven't seen any indication that'll happen yet, but it might. Not sure. Brian, you forget the code of conduct. <sighs> yes, the code of conduct. Voluntary. Yes. Bruce, and then I'll go up here. Hi, uh, Bruce McDonald, uh, Johns Hopkins, SICE, and uh, Federation of American Scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, question, uh, first a, a specific question and then a, a more general question. Specific question, has Doug Lavero, uh, did he do that in a speech or congressional testimony where he said he would favor the kind of narrow thing you just described? Uh, Are you he, aware? He wrote it in an article in the Space Review I think a year and a half ago or so, right after, within a few months after he left. And he's talked about it. Um, the context was, what principles should the U.S. be pushing for in future space governance initiatives? Okay, thank you. And now, my, uh, my question uh, to, primarily to Ankit, but uh, uh, any of you. Uh, I would agree with your analysis about the objective uh, uh, for the uh, Indian ASAT test primarily being Pakistan. But it seems to me that there could be, uh, they would, as an important secondary thing, that China would be relevant as well. Uh, the, uh, it was announced in a, a recent government publication or sometime back that China may have a, one sort of semi-operational BMD base. And I wondered if, because of the, uh, you know, the growing toward a competition, strategic competition between China and India, that, uh, that India might want to at least put a little uncertainty into China's mind with the test they could always maybe expand to a second site. That, that's, in other words, not that that was the primary objective, but that might be a non-trivial secondary objective uh, of, the, of the ASAT test. And also, uh, thank you all for, for your presentations that I found very informative. Yeah, no, uh, thanks for that question. I mean. Um, with, with China and, and Indian BMD, the one thing I will say is that given just the numbers, uh, the sheer ability of China and the People's Liberation Army Rocket Force, um, China poses a saturation challenge um, in that there are just so many targets that even if India could create that kind of a doubt in the, in the minds of Chinese leaders and military planners, it would require a significantly larger uh, BMD force than currently exists in India. But given Pakistan's limitations, uh, it's much more useful there. And I believe the base you're talking about is Korla, which is actually not that far from the Indian border. And that's where the, uh, that's what the Chinese actually do there, hit to kill intercept tests using the DN-3 system. So the wouldn't it be true, though, that uh, a, a limited BMD would uh, mitigate the option of a limited uh, 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 signal sending nuclear strike against India. That they that might pose more of a challenge. Because I agree, all out uh, uh, they they could overwhelm it. But, but wouldn't that at least constrain China a little bit in the nature? It's one thing to send one or two nuclear weapons, but it's another thing to send a uh, uh, hundred. That's right, and. The only thing I'll say to that is that uh, given what we know about China's nuclear doctrine, I think just th that kind of a practice would be highly unlikely uh, for the Chinese to actually do in a conflict. Uh, so that's just another limitation I see with that. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I think absolutely the Chinese will have taken note of this capability um, of being developed in India. Down here. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julian Kyle Lewis from the American University here in Washington. I was also the Associate Director of the Office of Presidential Correspondence in 2011 for President Obama. Um, I guess I just wanted to clear up a few things and I have a question. Um, just as far as uh, Pakistan is concerned, the way the United States deals with a country like Pakistan, um, when we don't really trust them, but they're an ally and a strategic partner in the region, we'll say, hey, you know, uh, we'll let you tell the world that you have these nuclear warheads and we'll give you the cover for it even though we know that what you do and don't actually have and india is aware of that so they've been trying to call pakistan's bluff over the past course of however many months uh, that's point number one point number two um with president trump's space force and that's where my question is going to be um russia what he saw before he made that announcement um, Russia let out a cube into space, and what happened was a smaller cube came out of the larger cube. 
And then a smaller cube came out of the other smaller cube. <laughs> and he saw that. And he was just thinking, well, how would we defend if just a missile came out of one of those cubes at any given time? Because the cube has all of those different sides and angles. So it could come from the top or the bottom or the left or the right. That's what he saw. And he was like, well, space force. We need a space force. Oh, my goodness. How do you stop that? You know, so what I would like to know from anyone who wants to answer is uh, what do you think about the progress of President Trump's space force over the course of the past year? Thank you. Um, so on that, so you mentioned basically the satellite series, uh, Cosmos, uh, 2519, 2521, 2523, you're talking about the sort of the, the Maratushka satellites you're talking about. Um, yeah, that was something we saw. It's not necessarily new. Um, there have been, you know, multiple tests in the past, including there was a DARPA program 2007 where two satellites separate in orbit and then rendezvoused and didn't exchange of fuels and things. Um, I, I don't quite think that was the the impetus for the decision. The Space Force debate uh, long predates President Trump. It's been going on for 20 years or so. Uh, and the the most likely reason why he came up with that uh, is that there was a, a, dis, a, a study, a congressionally mandated study underway that was evaluating multiple different options for restructuring military space activities one of which was the Space Force. And in the midst of that study over the course of, of, of um, well, our last spring, um, for whatever reason, he seized upon that as what he wanted to see. Uh, interestingly, that the actual policy proposal put forward a couple months ago by the administration is not a separate, uh, a separate but equal space uh, service, as he put it, but a core underneath the Air Force. Um, as to where that stands, uh, it's in Congress's hands at the moment um, because that sort of a change has to be authorized and funded by Congress. And so it's being discussed as part of the FY20 budget discussions. Um, we'll see probably end of May, early June when the markup happens, whether or not the initial mark includes a Space Force or not. Um, uh, and then whether or not they come to a budget agreement by October 1st, very unlikely. Um, it, it probably won't be resolved until I would say late fall or early next year if the budget negotiations go on that far. Another question? Actually, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Just add a, a brief advertisement um, to my colleagues from CSIS. Uh, do you guys want to talk about your documentary really quickly? Oh, yes. Hi, I'm Caitlin Johnson. I'm the Associate Director for the Aerospace Security Project at CSIS. Uh, we featured Victoria and several other experts um, talking about the history of the Space Force and this debate of national security space reorganization. It's called Commanding Space, uh, the story behind the Space Force, and it can be found at our website, aerospace.csis.org. And Victoria has the best line in the entire thing, so I really recommend you check it out. Yeah, it's very exciting, and it's 18 minutes long, just FYI. <laughs> Not my line. <laughs> Is there any, another question out there at all? Yes, uh, over here, and then on the front. Uh, Jay Gullish, a US India Business Council. Uh, two separate questions. One, um, I know there's clear desire for commercial space industries in both India and the United States to work together, figure ways out how to share technology solutions and services. Um, does the does the ASAT test help hinder or is it completely neutral on on commercial industry working together from the two countries? My, my second question is um, later in the year the uh, US and Indian government um, have a space dialogue uh, scheduled on civil space. Um, what are some sort of proactively, what are some of the things that two governments can talk about to perhaps um, you know push the the, the concept of of space stability and how the two governments can, you know, both work together to to enhance that. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll take a stab at the first part. Um, on the surface, uh, I don't see it affecting it one way or the other. The the ability or the the possibility of the commercial industries working together, with the one exception of. Um, and this is this is striking. So you're talking about how it really was a, a veiled BMD test. If you're deploying and developing an ASAT weapon 
and you don't have the ability to track targets other than TLEs that are published by the 18th Space Control Squadron, you might want to look at that. I mean, they're not necessarily target quality information. Uh, your, your seeker has to be much more capable. Um, so, so if they're going to go down this path, they need to build an indigenous SSA capability. And you talked a little bit about it, but for a country that wants to go from zero to 60 and doesn't have the five decades of Cold War experience and ballistic missile defense deploying global sensors, commercial is one way to jumpstart that uh, development of, of indigenous SSA capability. Yeah, I mean, just building on that idea, um, you know, one of the, the strongest, I think, sharpest criticisms after the ASAT test came from some of the new space commercial actors. He said, we are not happy about this because, you know, this, this affects our, the domain, affects our ability to utilize it. Um, you know, Planet, for example, is one of them that, that said that, and they often get their satellites launched by the PSLV. Having said that, I don't know that they've changed their thinking in using the PSLV, so maybe it's just you know, a show of unhappiness and we'll go on from there. But it, it definitely was said that. Um, and then in terms of this U.S.-India civil space dialogue, I mean, I, we keep harping on this, but SSA is foundational to the use of space, whether it's civil space, security space, scientific space, commercial space. It is foundational. And the, we really need to have a way to share information back and forth because, as Baba said, um, sensors can only do so much. Owner operators have very good information. And there should be a way in which to share that information so you have a better picture overall of what's being used in orbit. In the case of Planet, they actually did have a PSLV launch in early April, so just, days, yeah, yeah. just days after they criticized India, yeah. which was very interesting. I, I, yeah, in, in Planet's defense, I don't think they're going to pull a bunch of satellites off that that time scale, uh, particularly when the PSLV is one of the few options they have. Uh, that said, they were very serious about their concern about this. And, and, I, and I, other companies, not all have been as publicly adamant, but many have been expressing concerns. Uh, and their concern is that this sort of testing that does create more debris, any debris in low Earth orbit, could impact their business models, right? And their ability to do stuff in low Earth orbit and make money off of, you know, whatever the business model happens to be. Uh, I think if there were more launch options other than the PSLV at this point in time, you might have seen a different response uh, from, from companies, you know, expressing their concerns. Uh, but I think, you know, like the U.S., they may have made it a, a, a decision that even though we're unhappy about this, you know, the 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 importance of us getting our satellites into orbit kind of out, outweighs taking the action about it. Um, but I think there is a broader question here is that is how is this proliferation of counter space technologies that we talk about in our report and CS talks about in their report, how is that impacting this commercial development of space? You know, you have on one hand all this discussion of kind of, you know, the trillion dollar and more space economy and the commercial boom and going on. And then you have a separate discussion going on that is the proliferation of anti-satellite technology, anti-satellite testing, and concerns about war extending into space. There's not a lot of overlap that I've seen among those two communities and those discussions, even though there probably should be, because I think they impact each other. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll find ways to maybe bridge those discussions at some point. Uh, testing one, two, yeah, Jim Armour with Northrop Grumman. <laughs> um, as a student or a victim of five decades of nuclear strategy and politics, um, I'm, I'm still, it, this discussion sort of makes my head hurt. I mean, it, I've heard it all before dozens of times. And to me, the most illuminating part of our discussion has been from Bob, with the commercial capabilities to show, you know, some degree of attribution, transparency, tracking, and consequences of these, these activities in space. So what I wanted to ask you, Bob, is, um, is, is this a growth um, area in the commercial business? Are more and more folks going to start investing in commercial um, space situational awareness or in, in a transparent way? And furthermore, are you seeing the insurance folks roll in in a sort of a liability regime where you can actually attribute, oh, after this test, this part hit that satellite and lawsuits or whatever ensue? Um, are you seeing anything like that evolving, Bob? 
Uh, let me try and go in order. So um, is, do we think this is some sort of a growth area uh, with regard to SSA in, in, in this environment? Um, I, I don't see the ASAT being a, a tremendous uh, swinger here, but the, the broader problem, and I alluded to it, I, di I didn't really uh, foot stomp it, there, there's, a, there's a gap between what is published or tracked today size-wise and the size that an operator needs to be concerned with. And, and what I mean by that is th there's a, a, a small enough size that if, if you have a satellite get hit by that, it will damage your satellite. It may even uh, completely disable your satellite. You'll have a dead satellite. It'll maybe go through it, produce very, very little debris. There's uh, bigger and bigger pieces of debris, and you get to the point where you can have a piece of debris hit your satellite. It disables your satellite, and it creates a debris field. Um, and then as we keep going up in size, it's higher than that that we get to the size of things that we as humankind know about today that we can measure with the sensors we have today. So if, you're, if you have a business plan and you're putting up hundreds of satellites in a common altitude, and there's that no man's land where the thing is too small to be tracked, but big enough to basically take out your entire business model. And that, that really is the Achilles heel, I would say. Now, space fence coming online should help close that gap. There are other commercial capabilities being looked at that might help close that gap, but basically to drop the the perceived line closer to the, the size that kills my business plan line. And I, I think that is a conversation that's going on. We, we haven't seen it uh, completely uh, hit the knee in the curve yet because a lot of these large constellations remain on paper. You know, we've seen OneWeb has launched, what, four or six satellites. We're still in the very, very early stages. I think as these constellations actually come to fruition, that entire conversation is going to change rapidly. Um, the other question you had was about insurance. Um, I, the attribution angle is an interesting one. Uh, we haven't talked too much about that. We have talked a, a lot about collisions and insurance uh, and insurance companies and their insured, the commercial owner operators, and, and what has to be tracked and what's the risk and is there a is there a dynamic where the insurers would get to the point where they would uh, almost uh, demand or require that the insured does more to understand their environment? And insurance, it turns out, is a very funny game where um, sometimes it sounds like they want losses once in a while. Um, and and it's it's sometimes we've had to scratch our head when we have these conversations with the insurance industry. That doesn't mean that they're looking for, you know, death and destruction and gloom, but there's, there's an interesting dynamic there. And, and then on top of that, take for example, Intelsat 29E, which just died last month. It was a three or four year old satellite, which guess what, was not insured. Because operators often operate on the very hairy edge, you know, from a profitability standpoint, so yeah, the beginning of the mission, and then that's it. I'm not going to insure the rest of the mission. So, the the whole insurance question is is a dicey one, I would say. Sorry, I'll just add on that. We did a, a workshop with uh, uh, several reps in the insurance community uh, beginning of last year, I think, talking over basically the issue whether or not insurance could ever be an incentive for responsible behavior. Uh, the short answer was no, not at the short term, but if the, some things change in the space world, that could be. Um, and that report's available on our website. Just to add on something that Bob said, um, the insurance company, at least in the space world, tends to also be lagging in that they look they look for historical data and metrics to kind of drive their future investments. They're not, at least for the time being, not looking ahead to what might be coming in terms of how the, the metrics might be changing in the future. Uh, and because we haven't had any, there's no court cases, there's no lawsuits, there haven't been any actual damages in orbit that anyone's took anybody to court over. Um, there really isn't any motivation for them to start looking at that yet. I was really going to say that that's <laughs> there was, Yeah. Sir? Yes, I wanted to um, uh, ask about what the debris field is made of. What are the materials in the debris field? Um. Off the top of my head, I, I don't think I can answer that. I'd have to consult with some people. It's, 
it's the the re I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of alum, aluminum on the satellite, but beyond that, I I couldn't speak to that properly. Mm -hmm. Does that make a difference in how how sustainable uh, the refilled is, or how it can be cleaned? And is anybody working on that? Well, it, indirectly, it it does. Uh, so, for example, that that piece that I showed that that's three years out. Um, we, we've looked at a few different pieces. Again, we're, we're at the mercy right now of using the TLEs that the 18th has published for, for the debris population. And so um, there's, there's detailed uh, physical data that that process doesn't provide. Um, for example, uh, things about the ballistic coefficient and what have you. We've done some reverse engineering on a few pieces and seen uh, wild, not wildly, but significantly varying uh, ballistic coefficient, I indicating uh, a much more dense piece, which was the one that's going to take three years, as opposed to pieces that have a much lower ballistic coefficient. So it, again, it, uh, the other thing is we're dealing with, statistically, it's a fairly small population set, a couple dozen, several dozen pieces. So I'm hoping that more and more pieces, they say they have a couple hundred, I'm hoping that more of those get released um, and of course, as we get further from it, some of them will re-enter. Um, and part of your question is, what's working on to kind of clean this stuff up? Um, this particular case, you know, even the pieces in this that are that did go as high as 20, 2,200 or higher kilometers in apogee, the perigee is still down at two hundred eighty kilometers. So they're going to re-enter. Three years is longer than when claimed, but still relatively short compared to other things. Um, there, uh, there's quite a bit of R&D going on and technology development on debris removal in general, um, both government side and commercial side. Uh, the challenge is, is that so far no one's willing to really pay for that development. Um, the U.S. government, for example, NASA has said that they're willing to do uh, R&D up to TRL-3, which basically includes paper studies and on the ground, but no actual in-flight demonstrations. Um, the only in-flight demo that we know of so far, it was uh, recently done by the European Union that removed debris mission out of the Surrey in the UK, and they tested several different technologies that could in the future be used to remove debris, but there's still this gap between the technology demos and actually having an actual capability to go do it. Um, I would say related to what Bob said about the, the large constellations, there is a chance that that might help spur the, the creation of that capability. Um, if you've got a thousand satellites in, an, in a constellation, even at a 5% failure rate every three to five years, that's still a lot of dead satellites in your own orbit. And so a couple of those companies are talking with other companies about a tow truck kind of a service. Um, so that might help get the technology real. That's not, of course, they're not going to pay to clean up everybody else's debris, just their own, but that might get us somewhere down the road. But so far, um, most governments, including the U.S., have not really prioritized any kind of funding for that capability. Um, yeah. Nikolaj Schmidt, Charles University, Prague. Uh, my question is, do you think that the whole situation with India as a test can pave the road for laser technologies to be used uh, for not necessarily only tracking of orbital debris, but also taking down? The question, uh, you mean? Uh, Do you think that the whole asset situation, the, I mean, you know, what happened now uh, can pave the road for enabling and deploying laser technologies for orbital debris removal? Laser? Yes. Um, so there are a couple of entities working on this, um, primarily. Uh, a group in Australia uh, that is developing technology to uh, lays small pieces of debris in low Earth orbit to slightly alter their orbit. And over repeated attempts, they can bring it down faster than it would normally otherwise do. Um, I've heard they might be testing at some point this year, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I mean, that, that, that was going on long before this test happened. Um, and those particular technologies are looking at the much smaller pieces of debris, the less than 10 centimeter sizes that, that Bob was talking about. The challenge there is that those pieces are not generally well tracked. 
Uh, and so you, you know, you kind of have a challenge of how do you know that they're they're there in order to be able to laze them, bring them down. Um, so I don't think this test is necessarily going to push that at all, um, because it, it 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 is still a relatively small population of debris compared to other things and that have happened. Um, but it's certainly not going to hinder that development. I don't think. I think maybe what it does it just gives an incentive. Uh, you know, it, this is not something we're talking about an event. It happened, you know, 10 plus years ago. It happened recently, and it probably very likely is going to happen again soon. And so it becomes much less a theoretical discussion. Hey, it'd be nice to have dream removal technologies. It'd be like, oh my gosh, we people are testing ASATs. We need to have a way to handle that now. Question, uh, Ankit, for you. You, you mentioned uh, this discussion, I think you and actually had on, on Twitter at some point, over whether how much the timing of the test is driven by the election or not. And, and in the, 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 the video that came out after the test, I, if I recall, they said that the decision to start the program had started in 2014, and then the decision for the test was made a year and a half or two years earlier. So can you unpack that a little bit and talk about how much, if any, of the timing might have been driven by the, the election or how much the role of domestic politics played in all this? Um, so, you know, we have some evidence after the test that this is certainly being used um, in a political way, right? I mean, uh, the prime minister at one of his rallies shortly after the anti-satellite test made a reference to having conducted, you know, surgical strikes on land, air, and space. So the surgical strikes were something that India did after a major terrorist attack in 2006 when it claimed that it had crossed the line of control to strike at terrorist launch pads um, in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Um, but the fact that that was sort of compared to the anti-satellite weapon test at a political rally by the prime minister, I think, imbued this whole test with a, a degree of political significance. As far as the political ascent and the decision to move forward with an anti-satellite test, um, yeah, so what I've heard is that it's that same thing that, uh, you know, 18, 18 months to two years in advance of the actual test occurring, the decision had been made, so well, well ahead of the actual election schedule. Um, but the fact of the test certainly does coincide with the actual electoral calendar. In fact, when the test actually occurred and the prime minister announced it, um, the Indian Electoral Commission had to investigate the prime minister because India has a particular law called the Model Code of Conduct where um, members of the sitting government aren't meant to make major social or economic or other political announcements that can be seen as gaining an unfair electoral advantage. And they cleared the prime minister. He wasn't actually held culpable for making the announcement. But certainly the politics and the opposition definitely seized on it um, as a bout of opportunism. And we can look at it in a way uh, as, you know, India, again, imbuing a, a degree of techno-strategic optimism right before the elections, right? Um, the end of February, the conflict with Pakistan, um, in my view, did not go particularly well for India. India lost a MiG-21 and a pilot. Uh, the, the narrative of a, a, you know, a sweeping victory was not something that India enjoyed on the international stage, certainly. So carrying out this anti-satellite weapon test a few weeks later is sort of this major moment of national pride and, and optimism that you know we're now in this exclusive country, uh, club of countries that can destroy a satellite. Uh, so part of it is there, um, but of course I think the political ascent does come a lot earlier and I suspect we'll learn more about the factors within the Indian government that led to this as time moves on and we get a little bit more insight into national security decision making in uh, Modi's first term. Right, just to add on to that, I mean, I think obviously this is, you don't just do this at the drop of a hat, you have to plan for it obviously. Um, but my opinion is that it definitely the polit political situation had a lot to do with the timing, just because there was, as far as I can see, zero negative consequences for Modi for this test. They did it. They did great. The only criticism I saw was that it hadn't happened earlier. Um, so I really, so I, I guess, they, in my opinion, they figured it was a win-win. You know, you have the test. If it didn't work out, you just save the missile defense test and never acknowledge it. And it worked out great. You can, you know, demonstrate your technological prowess and uh, use it for elections. And it shows up. I mean, if you read articles about the Indian election and campaigns, it's every single, every single one that's mentioned. Any other questions out there? Is we're up, reaching the end here. Sorry. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, no, just a small point responding to uh, Ankit's uh, views on uh, you know the fact that India was not being seen as 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 having you know come out of that February thing well February you know Balakut strike and all well if if I understood it well mm, you know uh, 
just a minor point which is just i mean just to highlight that uh, you know when pulwama happened just to give you a, i mean sense of what happened when pulwama the terror strike happened on the 14th of february as i mentioned you know you need to look at the reaction of the world in terms of you know major countries almost around 50 odd country be more much more i mean the entire world coming out with some kind of understanding as to why uh, you know understand not coming out with a lot of criticism uh, you know over the pulwama terror strike uh you know if you look at the us you would have seen you should see the statements coming out of bipartisan manner of a lot of congressmen members of the congress here you know there were statements from the white house the statements from the state department and all that and then when bala court happened on the 26th you could see even there judging from the world reaction that you know there was this sense uh, uh, of the world that you know uh, something like this uh, terrorism being used as an instrument of street policy simply cannot go on and on and if i may just uh, inform you all i'm sure all of you are aware, aware of this uh, masood azhar uh, the chief of jaish e mohammed you know the outfit which claimed responsibility for the, for the pulwama attack on 14th of february has just been listed as a global terrorist by the un security council's 1267 sanctions committee so i rest my case there thank you any final questions at all from uh Uh, for the audience uh, about the Indian set test or where we're going, um, I do have one for Victoria. Um, you mentioned sort of where things stand in various multilateral discussions on space security and peril sort of things. One of the one things we talked about um, in our report was, you know, the notion that India might decide to test to get ahead of some sort of ban on anti-satellite weapons and therefore be grandfathered in. Do you think that? this test having happened makes it more or less likely might eventually get to some sort of global agreement uh this is that this should be not be done um i think it actually it makes us more likely just because again as i said before the previous tests we had to talk about were over a decade old and um now we have a country demonstrating this technology and being willing to test it so it, it's no longer a theoretical discussion you know it, it's something you need to actually deal with so maybe there'll be a silver lining coming out of this all right with that thank you very much and please join me in thanking our panelists